Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Anais Sim, and today we are joined by Evan McMullen. Evan is a pioneer in the decentralized identifier space, and she's also recently co-founded a project of her own called Disco.xyz, where she's working to create a trustless and portable identity and reputation system. There's so much to talk with you about, Evan. Thank you so much for being here. Thrilled to be here with you. Yes, super excited. Okay, so before we dive in, like I said, a lot to talk about. Want to get to know you a bit better. Uh, What's your journey? How did you fall down the crypto rabbit hole? So this story starts quite a long time ago. Um, When I was a kid, um, I was very interested in the new burgeoning internet in the 90s um, and how, you know, data and files could allow me to enjoy new experiences. Um, So, you know, some of us might remember Napster back in the day, things like LimeWire and BearShare. um, And I had to present to my parents, who are both attorneys, why my non-commercial educational use of these platforms to share music with my friends constituted fair use. Um, and, a, and so from there, I learned that there's a relationship between the data that spins around us and the experiences we can enjoy online and the legal wrappers that you know govern the world around us. Um, so when I got to college, I was very into remix culture and how we can make information more free. Um, and so I got really excited about the free and open source software community, sort of Foss and Floss. Um, I learned about Creative Commons licenses that helped us to extend copyright and make um, information more freely available. And then I had uh, a woman who I describe as the greatest professor of all time, um, Elizabeth Stark, who uh, now leads Lightning Labs in the Web3 ecosystem. But at the time, she was my computer science professor. And um, she inspired us to learn about censorship-proof networks and to um, question the bounds of governance that created the world of data around us. And so through her, I learned about visionaries like Larry Lessig and Jonathan Zittrain. Um, she brought in a number of her entrepreneur friends, um, folks who had started Reddit and Facebook, um, RSS feeds, uh, co-founders at, and, and early employees of places like YouTube and later on then Snapchat. Um, and so this experience really opened my eyes to the fact that if you and your friends came up with an idea for how data could move differently, um, all you needed to do is inspire a group of people to help you with resources and you could go and build it. You did not have to ask for permission. Um, and it was around this time that I learned about Bitcoin as a censorship proof network through this series of incredible experiences. Um, and it has lived rent free in my head ever since. Um, so that's sort of how I started my journey. Um, And my career has wound through a a series of rather unexpected steps. Um, All of them really focused on this interaction between, um, you know, human beings and digital interfaces. Um, At the end of my college career, I actually wrote my thesis on how people interact in digital spaces. Um, At the time, uh, in, you know, the sort of early 2010s, um, a lot of the academic world didn't see great merit in studying platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Um, But I had taken a random anthropology class and learned about the um, academic frameworks that were used to study remote island tribes back in the days of Margaret Mead and thought, you know, why, why not use these approaches to study tribalism in digital spaces? Um, those of us who participate in crypto Twitter certainly know what that feels like today. Um, but at the time, you know, there's a lot of joking, Evan's studying Reddit for credit. Um, but what that really taught me was that the interfaces we interact with, the tone that we use to, you know, um, speak to other users really defines our privacy expectations in digital spaces. Um, an understanding of, uh, you know, how we're interacting with others and the, um, sense of comfort that we feel in those interactions helps to give us trust cues that then, you know, go on to inform how we engage um, with the rest of the world. And so through that experience, um, I've spent, you know, many years thinking about what it means to have an identity in digital space and what it means to assert that identity to others. Um, 
as you can imagine, in, uh, in my studies of platforms like World of Warcraft, there were many instances where people represented themselves in ways, you know, other than uh, who they present as in physical space, um, whether that is a different expression of gender, a different expression of the kind of creature you present as. Um, but at the end of the day, these choices are um, just a reflection of us as individuals, us as the multifaceted center of of the party reflecting to the world the parts of ourselves that we want, which is why our current project today is called Disco. Wow, what an incredible story and major props to that early professor of yours who really inspired this whole journey. I super resonate with that because that's also one of the ways that I fell down the crypto rabbit hole was the course that I took in university. So educators are everything. Um, you talked a, about a lot of really interesting things there to kind of just start off the conversation. Um, I know that you spent a lot of years thinking about identity and reputation in an online environment. So to level set here in the context of the internet, what does identity mean and why is it important? So, um, this is a great question because identity is a pretty fuzzy definition. Um, in my own practice, we think about identity as um, a, a combination of two pieces. Um, you have your identifier, your name. So my name is Evan. So as far as the government is concerned, that's my government identifier. On Twitter, I'm at proven authority. So as far as Twitter is concerned, that's my identifier. In the Ethereum ecosystem, I have my preferred public wallet address and my ENS name, and those are different identifiers. Um, but not all of those things are identities. So an identifier is just the name, the, the public way that others address you. And the data that describes the actions you have done with that identifier, the tweets you have posted with your handle, the transactions you have approved with your public address, um, this set of uh, actions, traits, qualities that describe the footprint that you have expressed in the world using your name um, is sort of the, the um, bulk of what makes up your identity. Um, but I believe that an identity is a show of control over both your name and the data that describes your past actions. So taken together, an identity needs to have some way to prove things, which often in our Web3 world means having signing keys that can express your autonomy and control over both that name and the data that describes it. Now, this is a little bit different than how a lot of folks in Web3 and, and certainly in, you know, the digital ecosystem casually use the term identity. Um, we're seeing many emergent patterns using the tools we have today where folks use things like NFTs to assert their identity. Um, I know that this is popular among um, many of, of our Web3 set, especially those that are, um, you know, big in the NFT degen game. But I would note that a, an NFT, you know, like your government name, is just an identifier. Um, without signing keys, an NFT cannot prove anything. So it is a fun name, but it's very difficult for that asset to be inextricably tied to you as an individual in a way that preserves your autonomy. So NFTs can be bought sold, traded, uh, gifted, uh, even stolen. And so because these assets do not sh provide the context of how they were acquired, they offer a very weak basis for reputation. Um, and sort of similarly, I mentioned, uh, you know, it inextricably tying traits to oneself, that non-transferability of traits that make up you um, should be totally under your control and your ability to choose whether or not you want to express them. And so at Disco, we believe that non-transferable NFTs diminish autonomy. They are the opposite of freedom because they immutably map a token ID to your public address in a way that does not involve your participation often. Uh, you may perform some other action that then causes someone to send you a non-transferable NFT. Um, but we believe this creates a really dangerous security pattern 
because if we can imagine, let's say we all embrace non-transferable NFTs as our method of inextricably tying traits to our public addresses, um, this means that those ties are immutable. They are public and we cannot change them. So this diminishes the autonomy of our public address because we have, you know, one asset less worth of flexibility for how we express ourselves. Um, and the reason that I mentioned that this could be a massive security risk surface is that um, let's say, you know, we do adopt these as a standard um, and we all embrace non-transferable NFTs and the cost of minting NFTs goes down precipitously. Should that happen, you can imagine that as in the early days of the internet, we might start receiving non-transferable NFT spam. And let's say, you know, I receive a non-transferable NFT with illegal content in it to my favorite public address. Um, my choices are that either I must live forever with that dark mark on my wallet, or I need to pay, you know, right now quite a lot of money to transfer all of my beloved assets into a net new wallet. And in so doing, I will lose my transaction history. And so it will be as though it's my first day on the internet meaning that I will have abandoned my, you know, past DeFi credit history, my participation in, you know, applications like rabbit hole. Um, and so divorcing your um, public address from your past history is like separating the two parts of your identity and abandoning the past history and qualifications traits that you've accrued to start anew. Um, though this is not, you know, the worst thing in the world, we don't think this is a particularly efficient pattern. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of things um, that we could go deep down into from that response. But, you know, first of all, to level set here a bit, I think that some listeners may be uh, confused about this distinction between your identity and your reputation, specifically how your reputation evolves in a Web 2 versus a Web 3 context and the different sections and assets and actions that comprise that reputation um, in an online context. Can you can you describe that a little bit for everyone? Sure, absolutely. So in the Web2 ecosystem, we don't really have the opportunity to interact with our reputation. And when I say reputation, I mean that bundle of data that describes the past actions that we have undertaken. Um, and so in Web2, um, we visit apps to be surveilled. Um, we visit app environments so that the data we create as a function of our interactions with those apps is consumed by the apps, owned and controlled by them so that they might interact with other apps and taken together offer us a more personalized experience. Um, you may uh, you may imagine experiences from your own life where you've been sitting with some friends at a restaurant talking about couches. You don't Google anything, but maybe someone else does. And suddenly you get home and your Instagram is full of couch ads. Um, and so without the ability to participate in that conversation and be, and be able to view the way that your reputation, your actions are flowing around you and informing the experiences you have, it can feel pretty creepy. Um, and this lack of autonomy further is clear by the fact that, you know, these organizations and applications are monetizing the data that we generate for them and share with them. Um, and so in Web2, we don't have a great way to surface our own reputation and view it and understand it ourselves. Uh, there are some indicators sometimes that apps provide to us, such as our Uber rating, um, but we have very little understanding of how those pieces of reputation come to be. And we have even less control of how we get to use those pieces of reputation. Um, so for example, if I have a great Uber score, I can't bring that over to Lyft to show them what a great uh, rider I would be and bootstrap my reputation in that ecosystem. Um, so what's very different in Web3 is that the concept of ownership and control can extend to the data that makes up our expression. And so if you have the ability to own and control your Uber score, you can bring it with you into other contexts. So for example, let's say, you know, let's take a credit score. Um, in the United States right now, it's really challenging to bring that credit score with you, let's say if you move to France. 
But if that credit score was given to you in a trustless form, in a credential that only you owned and controlled, that was signed by the credit bureau, tamper-proof and unable to be altered, um, then when you arrive in Paris, the credit bureau there could easily recognize it, trust that it hasn't been tampered with, and interact with it. Um, now, of course, governments are, and, and uh, credit agencies are pretty far behind on this journey. And so you can imagine that, you know, perhaps a nearer term opportunity would be to capture parts of your financial reputation and to present those in DeFi to receive, you know, under collateralized loans uh, without meaningful reputation in DeFi. We and, you know, with the benefits of smart contracts, we can enjoy things like over collateralized loans. Um, but a more robust system of reputation will mean in Web3 that we can solve more interesting coordination problems together. So what I mean by that is if the only thing I know about you is your Ethereum address, then all I know about you is how much money you have, what tokens you've purchased, what on-chain interactions you've had. Um, but that data set is quite limited because it's only data that's appropriate for everyone in the world to know. Uh, it's only data that's appropriate to be documented immutably often, um, and it uh, it is sort of limited to the constraints of how on public chains can operate. Um, and so this means that in Web3, with the form of reputation that we, that we collect around our identifiers, um, that reputation can't contain or cannot safely contain data about you and me as people. Um, so personally identifiable information or PII, I believe never belongs on a blockchain. It is an expensive overshare and it diminishes the autonomy and control that users have. Um, and so in order to enjoy the fullest expression of the metaverse, we believe that your data should travel with you in the same way that your tokens do. But unlike tokens, that data should be private to you um, and should be subject to your consent when it's shared. Yeah, I think that also kind of goes into um, what you see as what data should be stored on chain versus off chain and how decentralized identifiers can kind of serve as a melding of the two. But again, to level set and provide some context, because I feel like honestly, decentralized identifiers are an area of focus that a lot of people, even in the Web3 ecosystem, haven't completely wrapped their heads around. So being the decentralized identifier woman, <laughs> can you describe what decentralized identifiers are and, you know, why are they so important to the world that we're living in today? I love this question. Decentralized identifiers are the most fun that we've ever had in Web3. And here's why. So right now, we have a lot of names in the Web3 ecosystem. We have our Ethereum public address. We might have a Bitcoin public address, Dogecoin, Polkadot, Tron, if you roll that way. Um, and so we have all of these different names that we are known by in Web3. Um, and I don't know about you, but I am tapping out on the number of wallets that I can interact with on a daily basis on many in many of these different ecosystems. Um, and so the challenge is that we have many different names and we have um, we have to limit what we can express with those names to the public chain or to actions on the public chain. Um, so as we know, bridges are, are one way that we can transfer data from one public chain to another. Um, but that experience is pretty rough. It's often expensive, as we saw with Wormhole this week. It can be a little, little you know, sketchy. Um, and so we also, you know, are, are limited in the ways that we can transact from chain to chain because only on-chain data and assets can be transferred from one ecosystem to another, can be shared between the two names that we might have, let's say, on Ethereum and Solana. Mm -hmm. um, and so the crux of decentralized identifiers asks the question, how can these names talk to each other in a way that does not incur publicity and expense? So um, I think of a decentralized identifier um, almost like putting an addition onto your house. So let's start with your Ethereum address. Let's say that that's your house. There's a public address that everybody knows when they come to that address that that's where you live and where you hang out. 
Now, a lot of people sometimes add a garage onto their house. Um, that garage might have a separate set of keys, and that garage usually holds things that you're not going to share with your guests when they come over to hang out. Um, that garage, in my case, probably has Christmas decorations and out-of-season clothes and you know stuff that's private to you that your friends don't really need to see right now or interact with. It's not going to be valuable to them, but it's super valuable and important to you. Um, so take your Ethereum address, your sort of your house, and stick a, a few characters on the front. In the case of an Ethereum address, it would be um, DID, or DID colon ETHR colon, and then your Ethereum public address. Um, and that prefix is like the garage that you build to add onto the front of your house or add onto the side of your house that holds your private stuff. Um, now, like a garage and a house, your garage is going to have a separate set of keys for that front door to the garage than the keys that you use to get in and out of your house. Um, and so that separate set of signing keys um, will allow you to send messages that are private, kind of like sending messages from your garage to someone else's garage. Um, and so what's really special about these garage keys, your decentralized identifier keys, is that they are derived from this new string, with the prefix and your public address put together. And so these keys, um, thanks to the magic of decentralized identity and the good researchers at the W3C, these keys can be rotated if you lose them or if they get compromised. Uh, so unlike our garden variety, you know, Ethereum or other public wallet addresses, um, these keys offer a greater level of security. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I've certainly lost a, a seed phrase or two in my time. And so having this opportunity um, just allows us to be a bit more flexible. Um, now, let's talk about what goes in your garage. Um, so uh, your public address obviously is able to be mapped to tokens, fungible and non-fungible. Um, and so there are public assets that others can see in your main house, in your Ethereum address or, or your public address. Um, but mapped to your decentralized identifier in your private garage of data, you can store data that is written about you by other people. So earlier we were talking about how personally identifiable information is not appropriate for global publication. Um, you don't want to put your phone number on a billboard in Times Square. Uh, a billboard in Times Square, as a side note, is less public than the public blockchain, just in terms of thinking about that scale. Um, and so when you store data about yourself, you're able to collect whatever sensitive data is important to you, whether that's your diploma, your, you know, um, medical test results, uh, your proof of attending events, um, your achievements on your Peloton bike, whatever those things happen to be that are personal to you. Um, so the form of this data that hangs out in your data garage um, are, is called verifiable credentials. Now, verifiable credentials, like decentralized identifiers, are a technical standard that allow for interoperable communication between names that live on different blockchains, between a Solana address and a Bitcoin address, let's say. Um, so a verifiable credential is kind of like the opposite of an NFT. NFTs are on-chain, public, um, immutable, and transferable often, and verifiable credentials are private. Uh, they are revocable or can be set to expire. They are non-transferable because it's a statement written by someone else about you. So it'll always be written about you, even if you hand that file to someone else. Um, and they, because they are private by default, you as the subject of that information get to choose who gets to see it under what conditions with what level of granularity. So correct me if I'm wrong, but your verifiable credentials are a subset of your decentralized identifier. That's a great way to describe it. Yes, your decentralized identifier governs the pieces of data in the form of verifiable credentials um, that are written about you. Now, what's really special about these credentials also is that it's they're basically the same form no matter who's saying them or who's reading them. And so a Bitcoin address can write a verifiable credential about an email address, and both of those parties can interact with it. In fact, that credential can be presented to a Doge address, and that Doge user will also be able to read it and interact with it. Um, so this is very different than the way that we 
exchange uh, data over bridges, where we have to be very cognizant of, you know, the native chain and ensuring that um, that that data is presented in an appropriate form for its destination. Um, so unlike bridges, NFTs, and on-chain data, um, verifiable credentials are free. They're just a little signed blob of JSON, a little encrypted JWT token up in there. And what that means is that the, you know, the electricity to power your computer is pretty much the only cost that you're going to incur. Um, and unlike mining, it's not an arduous or computationally intensive process. Um, it's about, you know, the same effort as making a PDF. Um, and so in this way, we can enable blockchains to trustlessly share data with each other with the same, um, degree of, uh, of assurance that we get from the public chain, but we can do this in a manner where that exchange of data is private, it is free, and it can be commonly legible by both Web 2 and Web 3. So just to just further crystallize this concept a bit more, can you um, provide some insight into concrete use cases of decentralized identifiers? That's a great question. So we are actually starting to see a ton of enthusiastic experimentation and support, both from the Web3 ecosystem, as well as even, you know, the OGs in Web2. Um, some of my favorite use cases for verifiable credentials have to do with capturing our non-financial proofs of work in the same trustless way that we can describe our on-chain financial effort and, you know, contributing tokens, spending money, et cetera. Um, so some examples of this in the educational space include, um, imagine if you're able to complete an educational module that teaches you about a certain subject, let's say decentralized identifiers. At the end of completing that content and learning all of this knowledge, um, usually you'll read an article, maybe watch some videos, complete a course, and then you just go on with your life without the ability to tangibly prove this new knowledge that you've acquired. Um, so at, imagine Instead, at the end of completing a module, you receive a verifiable credential that attests, Evan has completed this course, she has demonstrated aptitude in the subject matter, and now I have a little badge, a little private certificate that I can present to anyone, a future employee, or employer rather, a DAO that I would like to join, um, a hackathon that I would like to judge to prove that I have attained this aptitude. Um, now, I mentioned the DAO space because... Um, as you know, as we were talking about earlier, if all I know is your Ethereum address or your public address, all I know is the money that you have, which means that the only kind of problems we can solve together are treasury allocations, uh, trustlessly. And so if that is sort of the, the limit of our interaction, the little limit of the kind of problems we can solve together, um, all we can be is a group chat with a bank account. And so in order to push the future of DAOs further into solving more interesting coordination problems in a trustless way, we need some method of signaling to one another what we know, what we're good at, what we've accomplished before. Um, so right now, if you are an active contributing member of a DAO, let's say you're organizing events, you're hosting podcasts, you're writing articles, there are basically no ways on chain in a manner that preserves your privacy to allow you to capture these proofs of work so that you can prove your contributions and impact in the DAO. Um, so let's say I want to join another DAO, a new DAO where I don't know anybody yet. I'm going to have to show up on the Discord almost as though it's my first day on the internet. And I'm going to have to um, start contributing to that DAO uh, basically from the ground up because there's no way for me to trustlessly show them that I'm really good at writing articles or, you know, hosting events or designing logos. And so to lower the switching costs between DAOs and enable the true future of work that we are promised, we need more robust manners to trustlessly share parts of ourselves, our achievements, our knowledge, and our accomplishments. That sounds incredible and is a future that I'm super excited about. But I also think about who's giving out these verifiable credentials. How can we ensure that they're coming from reputable sources? And to me, that stands out as one of the ways, um, one of the things that needs to be happened for this type of technology to be widely adopted and used at the scale with which we're talking about. 
would you agree with that? What are some of the problems that we're finding there? And more generally, you know, what else needs to be done for decentralized identifiers to become widely adopted? I think about this question a lot. What does it mean to issue a credential? And how do I know that the party that issued it is someone I can trust? So there are a few steps here that we can take to make sure that we take the guesswork out of that process. Firstly, um, a unique trait of verifiable credentials is that they are always signed by their author. So no matter what, when you encounter a credential in the wild, you know who said it. Um, this is really special because for most of the data that we enjoy in Web 2 and Web 3, there isn't provenance. We don't know who said it when we encounter a random data point that may have been sourced from an API two or three apps ago. Um, and so being able to ensure the origin of that data gives us the first level of assurance. Now, another question. Um, so we see that, you know, some party has signed this data. How do we know who they are in real life? Um, often we talk about provenance in the Web3 space. People like to say, oh, NFTs have provenance, but I don't know about you, but I can't look at 30 wallet addresses and tell you which one belongs to people. And so human readable information is super critical for us as individuals to be able to understand the reputational units or credentials that we're receiving. Um, and so one great way that we love to do this is to make sure that the signing keys that are used to attest a credential also show up elsewhere in the world and can easily and trustlessly be linked to that those sign those the owner of those signing keys. So for example, um, let's say Yale University wanted to issue diplomas. Uh, I would recommend that they drop um, what's called a DID document, sort of gathering of service endpoints and credentials into the dot well-known resource of their DNS record. So what does this mean? Um, and a testor of credentials can take their signing keys and drop them in their website for all to see so that anyone who sees um, a piece of data signed by these keys knows that they sit at this website and they know that the owner of this website also owns these keys. So you can imagine that, you know, receiving a credential signed by Yale University um, might include Yale.edu as the public identifier where those keys sit. Um, and we can similarly attach uh, an identifier in a trustless way to just about any other public identifier. So um, Yale University could attach their Ethereum signing keys to their website their Twitter handle, their um, Discord account, their LinkedIn account, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so using a website to publicize your signing keys, letting them sit at that domain, um, kind of makes me think of, uh, it, let's say Yale University was a store on Main Street, and they put a sign in their window that said, this is our signing key. If you see anything signed by this key, know that it came from us. Um, and so this is one, you know, one way that we can easily attribute um, a set of signing keys to a human readable identifier, human readable set of identifiers. Um, then the other part of your question, how do we know that we can trust the party that issued this? So now we found out who they are. We have a diploma. It's issued to Evan. It's signed by Yale. Yale is Yale.edu and all these other identifiers that they have attested. So we know that this is the subject, Evan, and that the issuer is Yale University. Um, however, how do we know that Yale University is allowed to issue diplomas? How do we know that that party is an entity that we should trust when it comes to this issuance? Um, and so now we're getting into the exciting world of schema governance. So a schema is just the form um, of a credential. So for example, a schema can contain fields like name, year of graduation, college major, grade point average, date of graduation, the name of the dean, et cetera. Um, and so all of the little fields in a form that you might fill out, um, that's sort of tantamount to the schema of a credential. Um, now, in, in years past, I've worked in the B2B enterprise space um, where things like multi-party schema governance were super hot. 
Um, so we can imagine that in the future, um, organizations like the National Student Clearinghouse that I know is playing around with DIDs and VCs, uh, they handle transcripts for the students of America, um, as well as college conferences might come together to define a mutually agreeable definition of a diploma. Um, now, fortunately, the Decentralized Identity Foundation has gotten a jump on this and educational credentials are now a very hot topic with a lot of thoughtful consideration. Um, but what we've reviewed here is that the root of trust for data is, um, is the key for understanding just how valuable we should consider it. Wow, that's crazy to hear also that these larger institutions are really taking steps to adopt this technology. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of benefits like we've talked about to DIDs, but also always like to present both sides. So there are also critics um, who point to the limitations of DIDs, some of the biggest arguments being the that they think it re-centralizes user data, the permanence of on-chain data. So I think about my little brother, for example, who's getting into the crypto space, and he's very young, <laughs> probably doing some things that he shouldn't be doing. And that's all being tracked back to his wallet, which will be a part of his decentralized identity online and the consequences that that could have as he matures. Um, what do you say to those critics and about the limitations of DIDs? So I would look at um, DIDs as a complement to on-chain capabilities. Um, while there is merit and value to have data that is globally available, that is immutable, um, it is not appropriate for all forms of information. And it is not especially useful um, for many forms of information where you want to make sure that you have multiple parties agreeing when something happens. Um, so, you know, not to pick on them, one of my favorite beloved projects in the identity adjacent space is ENS. Um, but with ENS, so ENS does a phenomenal job of giving nick human readable nicknames to our profiles. I love my ENS address. I gift them often. But when it comes to ENS profiles, um, those text records are self-attested, meaning that when I fill out my ENS profile and I write in my Twitter handle and my email address, there is not a handshake coming from my Twitter account or my email consenting to the fact that they belong to me. So I could put Paris at ParisHilton.com as my email address on ENS and no one can stop me. Um, in fact, I could put at Paris Hilton as her Twitter account and I could just run off to the races and LARP as Paris. Um, and there's no way to limit that or to verify that. Um, Additionally, let's say, you know, I lose control of my ENS address. I'm camping for the weekend. It goes up and expires and someone else buys it. That means that the Twitter handle and the email address, my personal information that I have made public to the world is now under the ownership and control of someone who is not me. And the world has no idea that that is the case. And so if I don't want my email address to be broadcasted to every human being with an internet connection in the world, um, then I'm, uh, you know, I'm in a pretty tough spot. Additionally, you know, if I lose control of that ENS address that is mapped to my personal identifiers, um, let's say the new, the new holder updates those fields with blanks. So they're essentially deleting, um, my contact information. Uh, anyone with a copy of the ledger can easily just look back and have access to that plain text. Um, and so there really is, you know, a, a challenge here when it comes to autonomy and control and placing our personal data on a public blockchain. Um, if we enjoy the, you know, the publicity and persistence of the public chain for our data, that means that we um, diminish our autonomy over it. We default to an extreme public, which is even more public than the data that we generate in Web2. Um, additionally, as human beings, we change and we evolve. And so expensive on-chain transactions with global publicity are not appropriate for the parts of ourselves that, um, you know, need to, uh, need to evolve as humans do. And so creating reputation that can evolve and change, that can be revocable or set to expire offers a degree of remarkable flexibility, um, and no additional expense. Uh, additionally, you can imagine that for pieces of reputation or privileges that are one-time use or that need to be sort of marked upon completion, such as a ticket 
or um, privileges associated with receiving an NFT, um, that you know the the public chain is really not the most appropriate place for that information. Um, and sort of lastly, the uh, the limits of decentralized identifiers. I, I find that to be sort of a humorous phrase um, because I see them as so much more capable than your garden variety public address. Um, you know, your decentralized identifier can um, can interact with both on and off chain data because of the public address in your namespace and your your garage, um, and it can interact with any other just about any other blockchain address and many Web two identifiers. Um, and I am hard pressed to find a purely on chain solution that is able to offer similar flexibility and similar autonomy and control. Um, that said, I understand that on chain maximalism is a thing, um, and so I would. I would recall a story about Antonin Scalia, the late Supreme Court justice, very conservative gentleman who cared deeply about personal autonomy, but also was a big proponent of, um, of the sort of extended investigatory privileges of the U.S. government, allowing for surveillance of citizens after 9-11. Um, so when I was in college, I think this was about 2008. Um, there was a, a, a class, a law class at Stanford, um, where the professor challenged the students to identify as much publicly available information about Antonin Scalia as they could. And over the semester, they compiled a remarkable dossier, including information about which, you know, videos the family would rent from the library and the time of day that the lady of the house takes her bath. And assembling all of this publicly available information, presenting it to Justice Scalia um, to challenge his statement that uh, privacy is for those with something to hide. And immediately he was mortified and asked the students politely, please do not release this compendium of information about me and my family. I was wrong. And I realize now that the accrual, the aggregation of public data about me makes me feel violated, it makes me feel like I am losing my autonomy and control. And so beholding the totality of your public expression in a way that is obviously accessible to others, I think is a, a shocking experience that many who um, are, you know, on chain maxis have yet to uh, have yet to enjoy. And so I think that historical example gives us a great reminder that um, that privacy and autonomy are critical elements of our experience as people. Yeah, I feel like autonomy is a general through line um, in this entire conversation. And I know that it's central to what you guys are building at Disco. So do you let, let's start talking about this because I'm super excited for you and all that you guys are doing with the project. How do you get the idea for Disco and what problems are you trying to solve? Also, is it, should I say Disco or Disco.xyz? We're just called Disco. Our product's okay. just Disco. Our website is Disco.xyz, but we'll answer to any and all, any and all of it. We're just happy okay, you're talking great. about it. <laughs> okay, great. So with Disco, we believe that Web3 is missing a lot of the fun part. So as we were talking about earlier, you know, on-chain interactions are pretty limited. We can push money around to each other. We can sign things and attest to things, but that public data does not allow us to do things um, like capture non-financial proofs of work that can help our lives be more fun. So for example, if I can collect proofs of how many concerts I've attended, how many hours of music I've listened to, how many pieces of merchandise I've purchased for my favorite artist, then when I go to their show, I'm able to demonstrate that I am a true fan and I can enjoy the privileges associated with being an awesome and devoted fan. Um, but right now, those artists have no way to tell who in the show has listened to every one of their songs and knows every word and who is just there because their dad bought them tickets. And so, um, you know, we here in the Web3 ecosystem, one of my, uh, one of my heroes, Chris Dixon often talks about the thousand true fans. Um, but a question for Chris is, uh, how are you going to find the data to identify those people? Because right now that data is fractured and splintered across a variety of applications that those artists cannot access between Ticketmaster and Spotify, knowledge of the location of your fans and knowledge of their proofs of work are really absent. Um, and so bringing us back to Disco, 
we believe that um, that individuals, whether music fans, Web3 fans, or just general DGENs, should have the ability to, you know, collect these, these units of reputation that they produce elsewhere in the world and bring them in a Web3 ready form to the dApps that they love. Um, and so the reason that we started thinking about Disco um, is that my, my teammates and I had spent many years focused in the B2B enterprise space, uh, serving non-Web3 native enterprises and organizations. And the sales cycle for that process is extraordinarily long, convincing American Express and Coca-Cola that they should change the way that they interact with one another um, and undergo a significant amount of technical expense and retrain their employees and change their systems. Um, that will happen eventually, but it is a slow moving process. And it is also not a whole lot of fun on the day to day. And I believe that Web3 is due for a magical moment like we had in the 90s, where we were learning about the internet through um, curiosity and discovery, a sort of sense of wonderment and, and newness. And so um, to to sort of answer a, a short question with a, a long response, the reason that I think about disco um, actually started when I was an undergrad about 10 years ago. Um, so I have a very soft spot for Usenet. And um, may, everybody might not remember this, but there are message boards um, in the early internet. And they shut it down when I was when I was in school. Um, but I used to look at Usenet like it was the inner it was like internet archaeology, kind of like the Bitcoin forums are today, um, where we could go back and sort of see the history of how people started to use these tools. Um, so Usenet as an internet message board in about 1993 um, started to receive a flood of new users as um, access to the internet became more readily available. So in about September of 1993, there's this historical event that people sometimes refer to as the eternal September, where a flood of new users who did not have the netiquette joined Usenet. And instead of writing these posts in a serious and academic way and signing their names and using paragraphs and capital letters and punctuation marks, instead, these, you know, random kids from the 90s showed up on Usenet and, and invented spam and started sending chain letters and, you know, interacting in all these unexpected and informal emergent ways, because the cost of joining the network had become so low that it became accessible to everyone. The reason that we are starting Disco is that we need a new eternal September for Web3. We need to lower the cost of joining our network and our ecosystem to zero or as close as we can get to zero. We need to make it simple and joyful and exploratory to engage in Web3. And that means that we cannot put a prohibitive cost barrier or technical complexity barrier in front of our users. Um, even though that cost and complexity allows us to do extraordinarily powerful things in the DeFi and NFT space space, um, it is not welcoming enough for the world that we need to include. And so Disco is devoted to off-chain and private data because that low-cost, accessible, joyful experience um, that can do things like bring us to the front row of our favorite concerts and help us join DAOs that we're excited about, that we're qualified to participate in, and um, provide non-transferable proofs of attendance for events that we've participated in. Um, we see these kinds of activities as the, the true welcome mat of Web3. I love that. All about, you know, bringing more people into this ecosystem in a super frictionless way. And I think, um, you know, a big realization for me from this conversation is also all of the different use cases that decentralized identifiers can tap into and propel. Uh, we kind of touched on this. Super excited about Disco and all that you guys are doing there. But, you know, in an ideal world, what is your long term vision for the impact that Disco can have? In 10 years, you will be invited to a rave, a disco rave at the Louvre. Obviously, we will be hosting. And the only thing that you will need to do when you get up off your couch in Montreal is grab your best party dress or, you know, you can 3D print one in the hotel when you get there and have your disco profile. And that is all you will need to pass through the doors of your building, to pass through um, airport security, to uh, to get on the tram, to go through health screenings, border security on the other side, um, the event doors itself, and even the VIP room. Um, I believe that the metaverse is um, 
offers the ability for you to show up to any environment, physical or digital, and receive a personalized experience based on the facets of yourself that you present. And so Disco will help to lower the barrier of switching from one activity to another by helping you to present yourself um, in a way that can be readily embraced by the application or the physical environment that you're entering. Well, I'm super excited for that feature, especially because going through the airport with all of my documents is one of my biggest pitfalls of traveling. I feel like I'm constantly losing stuff. So Disco, gotta make it happen. I'm really excited for everything that you guys are building there. So Evan, this has been an incredible conversation. Uh, To end things out, every episode, we play a little game. I don't know if you know about this, (laughs) but it's- I'm so ready. (laughs) So the game is called This or That. It's going to be rapid fire. I'll give you um, 10 sets of questions, two words each. So you're basically just going to pick your preference for one word or the other. Again, no explanation needed. Rapid fire. Are you ready? Let's do it. Send it. Uh, Okay, let's do it. Web3 or crypto? Web3. Bitcoin or Ethereum? Ethereum. Discord or Telegram? Telegram. Bear market or bull? Oh, build and buy market. (laughs) Staying in or going out? Mm, Going out. Yeah, at the disco, of course. (laughs) New York or New Jersey? Oh, New York. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, writing or speaking? Speaking. ETH Denver or NFT NYC? ETH Denver. Investing or building? Building. Books or blogs? Books. Okay, awesome. That's it. That's the game. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun and I am very excited for our future adventures down the rabbit hole. Yes, same. Well, thanks again, Evan. Um, Thanks to the listeners for tuning in. And we will be back again soon for another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Bye, everybody.